right so the crux in the reinforcement learning is that uh, the agent is going to now this is learning agent right it's going to learn in a close interaction with an environment right so the environment could be the helicopter it could be the cycle right and uh, or it could be your backgammon board and your opponent all of this could constitute the environment a variety of different choices so you sense the state in which the environment is in right you sense the state of the environment okay and figure out what is the action that you should take in response to the state right so you apply the action back to the environment this causes a change in the state right so now comes the tricky part right so you should not just choose actions that are beneficial in the current state but you should choose actions in such a way that they'll put you in a state which is beneficial for you in the future right just just capturing the queen of uh, of your opponent is not enough in chess right? that might give you a high reward but it might put you in a really bad position so you don't want that right you really want to be uh, uh, looking at the entire sequence of decisions that you are going to have to make and then try to behave optimally with respect to that right so what we mean by behave optimally in this case right we are going to assume that the environment right is giving you some kind of an evaluation it's like falling down hurts right or capturing a piece maybe gives you a, a small plus 0.5 or winning the game gives you like 100 right so every time you win every time you make a move or every time you execute an action you did not get a reward or you did not get an evaluation from the environment right so it could be just zero it could be it could be nothing so i should point out that uh, this whole idea of having an evaluation come from the environment is is just a mathematical convenience that we have here uh, but in reality if you think about uh, biological systems that are learning using reinforcement learning right all they are getting is their usual sensory inputs right so there is some fraction in the brain okay that sits there and interprets some of those sensory input as rewards or punishments right so you fall down you get hurt i mean that's still a sensory input that is coming from your skin right or somebody pats you on a back that's still a sensory input that comes from the skin right it's just another kind of an input right so you could choose to interpret this as a reward right or this as a collision with an obstacle right if something is brushing against my shoulder let me move away right or you can just take it as somebody is patting my back so i did something good right so it's a matter of interpretation so this is a this whole thing about having a state signal and having a separate evaluation coming from the environment is a fiction right that is created to have a clear a cleaner mathematical model but in reality things are a lot uh, messier you know you don't you don't have such a clean separation right and uh, like i said uh, so you have a stochastic environment you have uh, delayed evaluation noisy so the new term that we have added here is scalar the new term we have had it is scalar so that is one of the things with uh, the classical reinforcement learning uh, approaches he said i'm going to assume that my reward is a scalar signal right so we talked about getting hurt and uh, e having food and so on and so forth what will all of this will happen mathematically is i'll convert that into some kind of a number on a scale right so getting hurt might be minus 100 right getting food might be plus 5 winning the game might be plus 20 right capturing a piece might be plus 0.5 or something like that so i'm going to convert them to a scale right and the goal is now, now that i have a single number that represents the evaluation the goal is now to get as much as possible of that quantity over the long run okay make sense right so if you have questions doubts stop me and ask so mathematically a scalar is easier to optimize uh not necessarily right i'm just talking about so it's it's like a cost function if you want to think about it in in terms of in terms of control systems right so this is like a cost and i'm trying to optimize the cost right and uh, so if the cost is going to be vector value then i have to start trading off one one uh, direction of the vector against the other so which component of the vector is more important so then it get into all kinds of uh, so pareto optimality kind of questions and so it's not really clear uh, what exactly is optimal in such cases so here again let me emphasize it's not supervised learning right in supervised learning this is essentially what you are going to see there will be an input 
and there will be an output that you are producing and somebody will be giving you a target output. Okay, so this is what you are supposed to produce and essentially you compare the output you are producing to the target output right? and you can form some error signal right? and you can use that error in order to train your agent. Right? You can try to minimize the error, you can do gradient descent on the error or you can do a variety of things and you can try to train the agent. So here I don't have a target, I do have to learn a mapping from the input to the output but I don't have a target and hence I can't form an error right? and therefore my trial and error becomes very essential. So if I have errors, right, I can form gradients of the errors and they can go in the opposite direction of the gradient of the error right? and then that will give me some uh, uh, direction in which to change my parameters right, that constitute the agent. The right? agent is going to be described in some way, right? the error gives me a direction. Right? But now since I, I do not know a direction, right? so I just I do something I get one evaluation, so I do not know whether the evaluation is good or bad. Right? So think of writing an exam. Right? I don't tell you the right answer, I just tell you 3. Right? And so what do you do now? Do you, are you happy with the answer? Should you change it? Should you change it in one direction or should you change it in the other direction? See what makes it even more tricky is I don't, you do not even know how much the exam is out of. So when I say 3, it could be 3 out of 3. Right? It could be 3 out of 100. Right? Right? Uh, so it could be any of these uh, things. Right? So you do not even know whether 3 is a good number or a bad number. So you have to explore to figure out A if you can get higher than 3 right? or 3 is the best. The second thing is okay, if I can get higher than 3, how should I change my parameters to get to become higher than 3? Right? So I have to change my parameters a little bit that way. Okay? I have to change the parameters a little bit this way. Right? So if I am cycling, right, I have to push down a little harder on the pedal. Okay, or I have to push down a little softer on the pedal to figure out whether I am staying balanced for a longer period of time or not. Right? So I do not know that otherwise unless I try these things I would not know. This is why the trial and error part. So if I push down a little harder and I stay balanced maybe I should try pushing down even more harder next time. Right? So maybe that will make it better right? and then there might be some point where I tip over. So I need to come back. So these are things which you have to try unless you try that you do not even know which direction you have to move in. Right? So this is much more than uh, just the psychological aspects of trial and error, there is also a mathematical reason. If you want to adapt my parameters, right, I need to know the gradient. Okay, so that you need to do this. Right. Sir, yeah? The reward is the one that uh, uh, you know that gives you the evaluation for the output. Right? So here uh, in the supervised case, the error <laughs> is the evaluation for the output. If the error is 0, then your output is perfect. Right? But then you have a way of gauging what the error is because you have a target to which you can compare. Right? And from there you get the error. So in the reinforcement learning case, the evaluation is directly given to you as the, uh, the evaluation of the output. Right? It is not necessarily comparing against a, a target value or anything. You do not know how the evaluation was generated. Right? You just get an evaluation directly. So you, you just get some number corresponding to the output. Right? So maybe I should have done put an arrow from the top saying evaluation comes in from there but, uh, but that is exactly where it is coming in. It is a substitute for the error signal but it is just that you do not know what the evaluation is. Of course, the way it differs from the error is uh, minor differences you typically tend to minimize error but you tend to maximize evaluation. Right? Uh, it is also not unsupervised learning. So unsupervised learning has some kind of an input right, that goes to the agent and then it figures out what are the patterns for the in the input. right? Here you have some kind of an evaluation and you are expected to produce an action in response to the input. It is not simply pattern detection. Right? So you might want to detect patterns in the input so that you know what is the right response to give. But that is not the primary goal. Right? But in uh, unsupervised learning the pattern detection itself is the primary goal. So that is the difference. Right? So here is this one slide which I think is uh, kind of uh, the soul of reinforcement learning. Right? Um, it is called temporal difference. So I will explain it a little more detail in a, in a couple of slides. Uh, but the intuition here, <coughs> right? so if you, if you remember the Pavlov's dog experiment, right? what was the dog doing? It was predicting the outcome of the bell. You know, if the bell rings, there is an outcome that is going to happen. It is predicting the outcome which is food is going to happen and then it was reacting appropriate to the outcome. Right? So most of reinforcement learning you are going to be predicting some kind of 
outcome that's going to happen. See, so am I going to get a reward if I do this, or if, I, or am I going to not get a reward? Right? Am I going to win this uh, game if I make this move, or am I not going to win this game? Right. So I'm try trying to always trying to predict the outcome. Right. The outcome here is the amount of reward or punishment I'm going to get. Right. This is essentially what I'm trying to predict at every point. Right. So the intuition behind uh, the, what is called temporal difference learning is the following. Right. So the prediction that I make at time t plus 1 okay, of what will be the eventual outcome. Let us say I am playing a game. Right? I am going to say, okay, I am going to win now. Okay, I am very sure I am going to win now. Right? So I can say that with a greater confidence when I am closer to the end of the game than I can at the beginning of the game. Right? So I have all the pieces set up. Right? If I am going to sit there then and say I am going to win the game, right? it is most probably wishful thinking. Right? But then you have played the game for like uh, 30 minutes or something and there are like 5 pieces left on the board. Now I am going to say I am going to win the game. Now I say I am going to win the game. Right? That is a much more confident prediction than what I did at the beginning. Right? So taking this to the extreme, right? so the prediction I make at t plus 1 is probably more accurate than the prediction I make at t. Right? The prediction I make at t plus 1 is more accurate than the prediction I make at t. So if I want to improve the prediction I make at t, what can I do? I can look, go forward in time right, and basically go to the next step, let the clock tick over and see what is the prediction I will make at time t plus 1 with the additional knowledge I am getting. Right? I would have moved one step closer to the end of the game. So I know I know it's a little bit better about the game. Right? I don't know how the game is proceeding. I know I can may now make a prediction about whether I will win or lose. Right? And use this, go back and modify the prediction I make at time t. Right? At t, I think there is a prob possibility of, say, probability of 0 0.6 of me winning the game. Okay? And then I make a move, then I find out that I am going to lose the game with a very high probability. Then what will I do is I will go back and reduce the probability of winning that I made at time t. So instead of 0 0.6, I will say, okay, maybe 0 0.55 or something. Right. So next time I come to the same state as I was at time t, I won't make the prediction of 0.6. I'll say 0.55. Right. That's essentially the idea behind temporal difference learning. Right. So it has a whole lot of advantages. We'll talk about it uh, uh, a couple of slides down. Uh, but uh, one uh, one thing is it's had a significant impact in uh, behavioral uh, psychology and in neuroscience. Right. So uh, it's uh, widely accepted that. Uh, animals actually use some form of uh, temporal difference learning and in fact there are specific uh, models right that uh, that have been proposed for temporal difference learning which seem to explain some of the uh, neurotransmitter behaviors in the brain yeah so suppose we are uh, playing a game and we have 10 moves that we can make and out mm -hmm. of 10 we will select the best one mm -hmm. okay this is the usual scenario yeah. so here the temporal difference is like we are selecting the move from next to next move no, 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 no. See, at this point, I will be making a prediction about what is the probability of winning. And it could be for each of the moves. Right? If I make this move, what is the probability of winning? If I make this move, what is the probability of winning? Let us say I, I, I make move 2. Okay? And then I go, I see a new position. Right? My opponent responds to it. And then I decide, oh my god, this is a much worse move than I thought earlier. So what I will do is, I will change the prediction I make for move 2 in the previous state. You see that the other other moves will not be affected because the only move I took was 2. Only about that move I have additional information. Therefore, I can go back and change the prediction I make for move 2 alone. Okay. So, you, you, you still have the 10 moves. So, you are not changing any of that. Yeah. Uh, okay. Going back and like changing the entire thing again or just changing the prediction? Changing the prediction. It is not like, I mean, if, uh, in an ideal world, you should be able to take back a bad move. Right? Except if, uh, if it is a parent playing with the kid, I do not think uh, those things are allowed. Right? Uh, in fact, when I play with my son, we have sometimes had to rewind back all the way to the beginning. It will probably be me asking to do the rewinding, not him, because he will be drubbing me in some one of those games. But uh, yeah, uh, otherwise you cannot. You just make the change the prediction. So next time you play the game, you will be better at it. At not for that game, well, basically uh, you are you're messed up. Or you did well, I mean, so whatever it is. Yeah. Okay, I hope I was not too boring and somebody fell over. Or, no. Okay. Well, that is known to happen. Yeah. 
So people sleep and I've actually had a person sleep and then fall off the chair once. Yeah. I, I still can't get over this. Okay, there is one one time I was going to teach a class, right? And as I was entering the class, one person was leaving the class. I said, "Hey, what are you doing? You're supposed to be in my class." He said, "No, no, no. I feel very sleepy. I can't." I said, "I don't care if you are going to sleep. Just go get back to the class, right?" And he looked at me for a minute. He just shrugged. He said, "Okay." And then he walked into the class, went to the last bench, actually lay down on the bench and went to sleep. <laughs> okay. And he recently sent me a friend request. <laughs> Uh, okay, going back to uh, uh, looking at uh, RL, right? So let's look at tic tac toe. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> how many of you have played tic tac toe? Good. Oh, yo, look, even you put your hand up. Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, okay, good. Uh, so, so in tic tac toe, so you have these board positions, right? And uh, so you make different moves. So in the first, this is what I have drawn here is called a game tree, right? So I start off with the initial board, which is empty, right? And there are um, how many possible branches there for people making moves? Nine possible branches, right? For excess move, there are nine possible moves. So I have nine possible branches, and then for each of these, uh, I'll have like eight possible. Uh, I'm not sure which is the right TV. Uh, for each of these, I have eight possible branches, and they keep going, right? So what we are going to be doing is uh, essentially uh, trying to uh, let's formulate this as a reinforcement learning problem. So how will you do this as a reinforcement learning problem? Right? So I have all these board positions, right? Let us say X is the reinforcement learning agent, and O is the opponent, right? So Initially, given a blank board, I'll have to choose one among nine actions, right? So the the state that I'm going to see is this black, the 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 X's and O's on the board, right? And the moves I'll be making are the actions, right? So in the initial position, I have nine actions. I make that. Do I get any reward? Not really. There's no natural reward signal that you can give. Essentially, the reward that I'm going to get in this case is if at the end of the moves, if I win, I'll get a one. If I don't win, I get a zero. And if I win, I get a 1. If I don't win, I get a 0. Right? So what is going to happen is I'm going to keep playing these games multiple times. Right? And at each point, right? Um, yeah, okay. So there is a note here. So what does that uh, note say? We have to assume it's an imperfect opponent, right? Otherwise, there's no point in trying to learn tic tac toe. Why? We'll always draw. And the way we have set up the game, you are indifferent between drawing and losing, so you learn nothing. I mean, basically, so you will not even learn to draw. Okay, you will just learn to yes. nothing. Basically, you learn nothing because you can never win, right? So you are never going to get a reward of one. So you will just be playing randomly. So it's, it's it's a bad bad idea. So let's assume that you have an agent that can that is imperfect, right? That makes mistakes, so that you can actually learn to. Figure out where the agent makes mistakes, where the opponent makes mistakes, and learn to exploit those things. Okay, right? So your states are going to be these board positions, as you can see. We give you a game that has been played out on the top of the slide, right? And the actions you take are in response to those board positions. And finally, at the end of the game, that right, if you win, you get a one. If you don't win, you get a zero. Right? Uh, Is that clear? Sir, in cases like this, I mean, does it have to be a binary sort of a reward system? I mean. Could you have a scale where there are three parameters? If you lose, it's zero. If you draw, it's one. If you win, it's one. Sure. You could even do other things like if you win, it is one. If you lose, it's minus one. Ah, so, so then couldn't you have a perfect opponent and learn? Uh -huh. and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you possibly could, but you probably have to play a lot, lot, and lot of games because the perfect opponent, it's, it's almost impossible for you to start getting any feedback in the beginning, right? You'll always be losing. So it's going to be hard for it to learn, but you'll eventually learn something. Yeah, it'll take a lot of moves. You'll eventually learn something. Go back. So, if I say that at every point, yeah. So uh, when you're learning, uh, like at a particular stage, the probability of winning and pro like uh -huh. when you update the previous there, yeah. state. Mm. So uh, you're storing information for you're storing information for each and every state that you have entered, right? Mm -hmm. So how will it be different from exploring the uh, prop uh, like state space every time? Because after you've done, let's say, a thousand, thousand games or a million games, 
you'll, you'll have explored a lot of states and you'll have to store for each state the probability of you winning at that point yeah. and all that. So how will yeah. that be different from exploring it again? Like, why uh, like, would I explore? I know the probability of winning from there. Why would I have to explore it again? Uh, no, uh, I'm... Uh, Let's, let's, I'm not even told you how you are going to solve it. Okay, let me explain that, okay. and then you can come back and ask me these questions. Okay, if you still have them. Okay, uh, okay great. So what the way we are going to try and solve this game is as follows. Right, for every board position, I'm going to try and estimate the reward I'll get if I start from there and play the game to the end. Right, every board position, I'm going to look at the reward I'll get if I start from there and play till the end. Now, if you think about it, what will this reward connot connotate? Right? So, if I win from there, I will get a 1. If I lose from there, or if I do not win from there, I will get a 0. Right? When I say, what is the reward I expect to get st starting from this board position? Right? It is essentially this average over multiple games. It's some games I will win, some games I will lose, uh, or I will not win. Right? Some games I win, some games I will not win. So, what will this expected reward represent after after having played many 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 games like the probability of winning right, right? The, the reward is going to represent the probability of winning in this particular case right if the reward had not been 1 right if it had been something else if it had been plus 5 that right, it would have been some function of the probability of winning right or if it had been plus 1 for winning minus 1 for losing and 0 for draw well it is something more complex it is no longer the probability of winning Right? It's it's the gain I expect to get, right? How what fraction of games I expect to win over the fraction of games I expect to lose, or something like that, right? It becomes a little bit more complex. So the there could be some interpretation for the value function, but in general it is just the expected expected reward that I'm going to get starting from a particular board position. Okay, so that is what I'm trying to estimate. Right? Let us assume that I have such a expectation well defined for me right as i say i have such an expectation well defined right now i come to a specific position let us say i come i come to this position here right let's say i come to this position how will i decide what is the next move i have to make <coughs> sorry whichever next state has the highest probability of winning so i just look ahead to see okay where if i put if i put the x here Right? If I put the x here, what is the probability of winning? If I put the x here, what is the probability of winning? If I put the x here, what is the probability of winning? Right? I do this for each one of these, right? And then I figure out whichever has the highest probability of winning, and I'll put the x there. Right? So that's how I'm going to use this function. Does it make sense? Yes. It's very important. So this is this is something which you should understand. This is the crux of all reinforcement learning algorithms, right? I'm going to learn this function that tells me if you are in this state, right? If you play things out to the end, what will be the expected payoff that you will get, right? Whether the rewards or punishment or cost, whatever you want to call it, what is the expected value you are going to get? And when I want to behave according to a, this uh, learnt function, so when I come to a state. I look ahead, figure out which of the next states has the highest expectation and then go to the state. Okay? Great. How do I learn this expectation? What is the simplest way to learn the expectation? I can randomly search through every, every time I come to that state, from that state, the fraction of games won you. Yeah, this essentially, you keep track of what happens essentially you keep track of the trajectory through the game tree right you play a game you go all the way to the end right so you keep track of the trajectory and if you win right you go back along the trajectory and update every state that you saw on the trajectory you update the probability of winning right you just increase it a little bit or you come to the end of the game and you found that you have not won right you go back along the trajectory decrease the probability of winning a little bit right Alternatively, you can keep the history of all the games you have played so far, right? At every, after every game has been completed, you can go back and compute the average probability of winning across the entire history of all the games in which you saw that particular position, right? Make sense? That's the easiest way of estimating this 
probability. Right? But the problem with this is A, you have to wait till the game ends, right? Or you have to store the history of all the games you have played, right? I mean, all of these could be potential drawbacks. Okay, you can get around the history part by coming up with an incremental rule. But the main difficulty here is you have to wait all the way to the end of the game, right? Before you can change anything along the way. So tic tac toe is easy. It's like how many moves can you make in tic tac toe at best? Four. four, right? The fifth one is determined for you, right? So it's basically four choices that you can make, right? Uh, so and uh, that's easy enough to remember, right? You can always wait till the end of the game, and then you can always make the updates right but what if it's a much more complex uh, situation right what if you're playing chess maybe you can wait till the end so what if you're cycling maybe you can wait till the end huh? exactly <laughs> we don't know right if it depends on where you're cycling if you're cycling learning to cycle in IIT Madras it's fine but if you're learning to cycle somewhere on Sadar Patel road <laughs> you don't want to even think about what end is there right so, so, so there's, there are some tasks for which you really like to learn along the way, right? So this is where TD learning comes into, comes to help, right? I don't think I have that slide anyway. Uh, and I'm not using the fancy thing where I can draw on the, uh, on the projection. So let's see if I can do it here, right? Um, suppose I have come here, right? And from here I have played, I, at this point, I know the probability of winning is, say, 0.4, right? So I came here by making a move from this position. So I said we were here, right? And we made a, uh, we, we know that the probability of winning from here is, say, 0.3, right? But I made the move from here to come here, right? But here I had thought my probability of winning was, let us say, 0.6. Right? I thought my probability of winning was 0.6, right? But then I looked at my next states and I found that the best one was 0.3 somehow, right? So I went there, right? But now since the best I can do from here is 0.3, me saying 0.6 here, there's something wrong, right? So I should probably decrease the probability of winning from here, right? So why could it be, why could it have happened that I thought that was 0 0.6, but the best among the next was 0 0.3? Maybe the other branch that you had explored, the 0.4, that was fully explored and all, it, all of that was decreased to 0 0.4. Oh. The thing is, so that whenever I came to, came through this part, right, maybe I won before, right? The, the, it so happened that when I went through like this, right, initially I would have gone through like this and played the game. Right, I'm the examples I drew, I might have actually won some of those games, right? So I would have changed this to 0 0.6, right? But it's possible for me to get here by playing a different sequence of moves also, right? So for example, to come here, right? I could have put the x first here and then here, or I could have put the x like I did here. I put the x first here and then here. Right? Either way, I, would, I, I could have reached this position, right? So uh, there are many combinations in which I could have reached the same positions, right? And just to be nice to these guys, right? To reach here, there are different orders in which I could have put the zeros and the x's. Right? Here we are showing a specific order. The zero was first put here, then put here. Right? The x was first put here, then put here. It could very well be I put the x first here and the o first here. And then I put the x here and the o here, right? There could have multiple ways in this thing was re reached, right? So sometimes when I play those games, right, I lost, right? Sometimes when I play these games, I won. Therefore, it turns out that for, due to some random fluctuations, right? So sometimes I win when I go through this specific point and therefore I have a higher evaluation of winning, right? But when I went through the other paths, I had a lower evaluation of winning. Right? But we know that really doesn't matter what path you went through in tic-tac-toe, right? Once you reach that point, right, what is going to happen further is determined only by that point, right? So what I can do now is take this point 3, right? You should update that point 6 down. Down. So I, I'm very confident here. I think I'll win with the probability of point 6. 
right? But the best probability I have from the next stage is 0.3. Therefore, here I should not be so confident, right? How far down? Until 0.3 or? Ah, good point. Uh, that depends on how stochastic your game is, right? So, if your game has a lot of variability, then you don't want to make a complete, uh, you know, commitment to 0.3. So, you might want to say, okay, now let me move it a little bit towards 0.3, right? But if it's uh, more or less a deterministic game, then you can say, okay, yeah, 0.3, yes, sure, let me go to all the way to 0.3. It depends on the... <coughs> Uh, yeah, it's misleading. It's called game tree usually, but it's a game graph in this case. Yeah. 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 So uh, is, is, is it clear? I mean, this is this is an instance of temporal difference learning. So how will I use the uh, the thing to update? Is this is called temporal difference learning? Okay. So there's one other uh, thing which I should uh, mention here, right? Uh, if I always take the move that which I think is the best move right now, right? Let us let's talk about it. Let, I, I start Tableau Rasa. I have never played Tic-Tac-Toe before, right? So I play the game. I play it once. I get, I get to the end. I win. So now what I do, I go back, right? Whether I am using temporal difference learning or waiting till the end updating, whatever it is, I change the value of all the moves I have made in this particular game, right? So the next time, I come to a board position, what am I going to do? I look at all possible outcomes. Everything except the one that I have played will have a 0, right? And the one that I have played will have something slightly higher than 0. I am going to take that. In fact, it will be like, how many of you watched the movie Groundhog Day? It will be like Groundhog Day. I will be playing, I will be playing the same game again and again because that is what happened to give me a win in the first time around, right? That, but that might not be the best way to play this, right? So, I need to explore, right? So, I need to explore multiple options, right? So, I should not be always playing the best, <coughs> best move, right? And I should not always be playing the best move. I need to do some amount of exploration so that I can figure out if there are better moves than what I think is currently the best move. So, in tic-tac-toe, there is inherently some kind of noise if your opponent is random, right? But if your opponent is not random, and if your opponent is also playing a fixed rule, and if you are playing greedy, then you will be just playing a very, very small fraction of the game tree, and uh, you would not have explored the rest of the outcomes, right? So, you have to do some amount of things at random, so that you learn more about the game, right? So, here is a question for you. When I am estimating this probabilities of winning, right? Let us say I have reached here. I look down, right? And the action that gives me the highest probability of winning, say, gives me a probability of say 0.8, right? But I want to explore, right? So I take an action that gives me a probability, say 0.4, okay? So I'll go from here to another action that has a probability 0.4. Right, another board position that has a probability of 0.4 of winning. So, should I use this 0.4 to update this probability or not? No. Why? That you, you are questioning the whole so TD idea. Already won with that particular sequence and you are now you are exploring it. So, no. you should not update it. When you're exploring, you should probably wait for the end of the end of the end. Or not, just ignore the exploration. Yeah, okay. Any, any other answer? You have to update it because you're learning that move. Whether it will be a good move or a bad move will be found out. I have to update the value of that move. I agree. Do I update the value of winning from the previous board position was the question. So that point 0.4 I'll have to change. Right? But do I change the point 0.8? That was the question. The point 0.8 was a probability of winning from here. Right? I look uh, or whatever was the probability, let's say I had a probability of winning of 0.6 from here. I look at the bottom and the best <coughs> probability of winning says 0.8. But then I take, because I am exploring, I take an action that has a probability of winning of 0.4. Right? The question is, do I go back and change the 0 0.6 towards 0.4 or do I leave the 0 0.6 as it is? Unless this goes over 0.8. Sorry? Unless this probability of this current thing goes over 0.8. 
That won't work. Right? I'm exploring, right? I mean, this is be, will be necessarily be less than 0.8. This will be 0.4. That will be 0.6. So the question here is, see, one way of arguing about this is to say that, hey, if I'm playing to win, right, I'll play the best action from here, right? And the best action says 0.8. Therefore, I should not penalize it for the bad action, which is 0.4, which I did to learn more about the system. Right? That's one way of thinking about it. Another way of arguing is to say that, hey, no, no, this is how I am actually behaving now, right? So I should give you the probability of winning about about the current behavior policy, right? It should not be some other uh, ideal policy. It should be about what I am behaving currently, and therefore I should update it, right? So which one is correct? First or the second? Questions. Yeah, but this is something. This is this is like I said. Right? I am going to ask you to think about the whole tic tac toe thing. And many of these answers have relevance later on. In fact, there are two different algorithms. One does option one, one does option two. Right? So, so the, it says no right answer or wrong answer. Right? It, answer is? It depends. Depends. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, that's, these are different things that you can think about in this. But I, now I told you about two different ways of learning with tic-tac-toe. One, wait till the end and figure out what the probabilities will be. The other one is? Keep adapting this as you go along, right? In both cases, you'll have to explore. That's the tricky part here. In both cases, you have to explore. Otherwise, you'll not learn about the entire game. So this is where the explore exploit thingy comes in. Okay? Yeah. So how do you know at what point to stop exploring and choosing the best? Great. Great question. And different algorithms deal with it different way. That's one of the crucial uh, questions that you have to answer in. Uh, uh, in RL. So it's called the explore exploit dilemma, right? Um, so you have to explore to find out which is the best action, right? And you have to exploit whatever knowledge you have gathered, right? Uh, and uh, you have to act according to the best uh, observations already made, right? So this is called exploitation, right? So the key, one of the key questions is when do you know you have explored enough? Right? Should I explore now or should I exploit now? Right? This is called the explore exploit dilemma, right? And uh, a slightly simpler version of uh, reinforcement learning uh, called the bandit problems. Okay, some uh, colorfully called bandit problems. Yeah, of course, he's an expert on bandit problems. Yeah, you can. Uh, uh, the, the bandit problems encapsulate this explore exploit uh, dilemma. My God, a lot of people are turning and looking at you, Shubhu. Know, uh, but so this will ignore a whole bunch of other things like the delayed rewards, you know, the sequential decisions and other things. So even in the absence of all of these other complications, right, even if I say that your, all your problem is you have to take an action and you will get a reward. Okay? Your goal is to pick the action that gives the highest reward. I give you 10 actions, you have to pick the action that gives you the highest reward. Right? But the problem is you do not know what is the the probability distribution from which these <coughs> rewards are coming, right? So you'll have to do some exploration. I, I have to actually do every action at least once, okay, to know what will be the reward, even if they are deterministic, right? So I can't I can't say which is the best action before I try every action at least once. If it is deterministic, it's fine. I can just try every action once, and I know what is the payoff, right? But if it is stochastic, I'll have to try every action multiple times. Right? How many times do you have to try it depends on the variability of the distribution. 